The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. My head has been swimming all week with ideas about what lesson I should bring to you today. Because 10 weeks ago, we started our studies in the book of Acts on the life of the church, which study I have entitled Christian Experience. And we started with a lesson in which I spent a great deal of time talking about the passion and defining the word passion for you, starting from the original Greek. Because this word passion has always been intriguing to me. Growing up in the church, the word passion was seldom used, perhaps because it appears only once in the Bible, in Acts 1-3, at least, that's the case in English, in the King James Version. However, in Greek, the word pasco appears no fewer than 42 times in the New Testament. And in the King James Version, it is most often translated with some form of the English word suffer. Now, the word pasco does mean to suffer. And the suffering that generally seems to be in view with the word pasco is the suffering of the crucifixion. And this is reflected in the fact that this phrase in Acts 1-3 is most generally translated after his suffering, or after his death, or after he suffered and died, or after his crucifixion. Now, there isn't a thing wrong with any of these translations as far as they go. Translators always have choices to make, and those choices are often hampered by limitations in the target language. I've told you many times that English is the single most expressive language in the history of the world, and I stand by that. However, one of the reasons for that is because English is so eclectic. If at any time English lacks a word to express a given idea, it freely borrows from other languages. For instance, in the culinary world, flavors have traditionally been divided into four categories. Sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. However, about 40 years ago or so, English-speaking chefs started looking for a word to describe the flavor of glutamates, esters, and onions. And they found just such a word in the Japanese language, umami. And now this word is common parlance among chefs and foodies. However, if you went back into the 60s and asked Julia Child for a single word to describe the common flavor in mushrooms, green tea, cheese, shellfish, tomatoes, and soy sauce, she would have been at a loss to give you a word. Well, the Greek word pasco has a complementary meaning that's vitally important to grasping the full sense of the word, but it's a meaning that's not easily expressible with a single English word. Yes, the word pasco means to suffer, but it also, and just as importantly, means to have something happen to one, to be or to come to be in a certain state or case, to be affected in a certain way, to be or come to be in a certain state of mind, to be subject to certain changes, to be modified in form, to be acted upon by or to take impressions from an outside force. Now, according to several Greek dictionaries, the zero-grade form of pasco is the word pathos. They aren't merely similar words, they're the same word, spelled differently. And pathos, as it is used by Plato and Aristotle, means to be affected by someone or something to such a degree that you come to identify with the other in a sense beyond that of sympathy or empathy or even communion, perhaps oneness or homogeneity. And there's another word that, according to several Greek dictionaries, is also synonymous with pasco and pathos, and that's the word pathema, with which you're already familiar. As you may recall from other lessons, there are three words, or at least three words in the New Testament, that are terms of art in Aristotelian physics. Dunamis, energia, and pathema. Dunamis is roughly the same as potential energy, and this word is generally translated power. Energia is roughly the same as energy at work, and this word is generally translated effectual working. And pathema is the midfix between the two. In the physics of the first century, it referred to the effect that one body has on another. By way of simple analogy, a golf ball contains dunamis, potential energy, in that it is designed with certain internal stresses and pressures such that when struck, it will fly further and faster than other similar objects not so designed. A golf club being swung contains energia, energy at work, which when applied to the golf ball will set it in motion, thus effectual working. And pathema is what occurs at the point of contact when the club strikes the ball. Pathema is the effect that one body has on another. 
and the pathology of that effect. It is, in fact, a form of the word from which we get the word pathology. In Romans 7, 5, Paul tells us, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. And the word that's translated motions there is the word pathema. Which word is used in the Bible not just to describe the pathology of sin at work in us, but also the pathology of grace at work in us? As we read in Philippians 3, 10 through 11, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his pathema, becoming like him in his death, that by this means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. And again in 2 Corinthians 1, 6 through 7, But if we are afflicted, it is for your calling and salvation, in which you receive the enduring energy of the same pathema, which we also experience. And if we are comforted, it is for your calling and salvation. Thus our hope for you is steadfast, for we know that if you participate together with us in our pathema, that you also participate together with us in our calling. And again, 1 Peter 4, 12-13, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, for you are participating in the pathema of Christ, so that you may thrive when his glory is revealed. Now, according to James Strong, going back as far as 500 B.C., both the words pasco and pathos were being used in a way equivalent to pathema. And beloved, this is more important than you might think. Because, I don't know about you, but growing up in the church, I was always taught that Jesus endured the passion and suffered in the process, but after the resurrection, he returned to heaven from whence he came and everything went back to normal. But that is not what happened. Yes, Jesus endured the passion, but what he endured was more than just the shame and the pain that he suffered on the cross. He also endured having something beyond his control happen to him being acted upon by, and taking impressions from an outside force, being modified in form, and being caused to come into a new state of being. Because in the Passion, Christ became obedient unto death. And death was the final nail in the coffin on the humanity of Christ. Because from the time that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and the power of the Most High overshadowed her, that the Holy Conceptus, which would be born of her, should be called the Son of God, Christ had always been fully human. But it wasn't until the Passion that he knew what it meant to be fully mortal. Indeed, until he gave himself up to die, his mortality was in abeyance, and it remained a contingency until it became a reality. When Christ underwent pathos, he was affected by his humanity and mortality to such a degree that he came to identify with them both in a sense beyond that of sympathy or empathy or even communion, but more like that of oneness or homogeneity. Uh, Jesus was already fully human, at least as human as anybody who has the authority to lay down his life and the authority to take it back up again can be. But when he exercised his authority to lay down his life and forwent his authority to take it back up again, he became mortal. And in death, he endured having something beyond his control happen to him. He was acted upon by and took impressions from an outside force. He was modified in form. He was caused to come into a new state of being. You see, God cannot die. Yet, Jesus is God, and he did die. And when he died, he was dead. It wasn't just the human body of Christ that died. God, the Son, the second person of the Godhead, died. Now, how can that be? Isn't that a contradiction? Well, no, and Jesus tells us why in John 10, 18, where he says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. Jesus had the authority to lay down his life, and he exercised that authority. As Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 6 through 8, Though Jesus was in his very essence God, he did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited Rather, he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, Jesus also had the authority to take his own life back up again, but he did not exercise that authority. Rather, he surrendered unconditionally to death and put his life completely in the hands of God the Father. 
And as Paul tells us in Romans 6, 4, God the Father raised God the Son from the dead by the energy of his own life substance, which is glory. God cannot die, yet Jesus is God, and he did die. Now, in the same way, God cannot change, yet Jesus is God, and he did change. And understanding this is key to apprehending the point of today's lesson. The church has long held that God is immutable. Now, the word immutable is deceptive to the ear. Upon hearing it, English speakers tend to intuit that it means that the word of God or that God cannot be silenced. Now, this is based on the reasonable but incorrect apprehension that the root of the word immutable is mute, from the Latin mutus, which means silent. Hence, that which is immutable cannot be silenced. But immutable actually stems from the Latin word mutare, which means to change, which is the root source of the English word mutate. So to say that God is immutable is to say that he is unmutatable. That is, he is inherently unchanging, and he cannot be changed by anything outside of himself. However, to say that God is stable is very different from saying that he is static. To say that God is immovable is very different from saying that he is immobile. And these are distinctions with a difference. For instance, consider these passages rendered forthrightly with that distinction in mind. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is himself yesterday and today and forever. Malachi 3, 16, for I, the Lord, am not fickle. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no doubling back nor slight of hand. And Psalm 102, 25 through 27, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are always who you are, and your years have no end. God is immutable, which means that he is stable and consistent, and he cannot be changed by anything outside of himself. But he can change if he submits to change, just as surely as he can die if he submits to death. And we know this because just as God the Son died when it pleased the Father to crush him, God the Son changed when it pleased the Father that he should take on the form of a servant and be made in the likeness of men. As John tells us in no uncertain terms in John 1.14, the Word became flesh. Now, that was ten weeks ago. And when I preached that sermon, I had a pretty good idea where I was going to go from there. But God had other plans. Because within a couple of days after teaching that lesson, a need arose for me to teach on human suffering and death and dying and why bad things happen to good people. And for the last eight weeks, I've been teaching on that. And I've been very happy to have brought you the lessons that I have brought you over the last couple of months because I feel that those eight sermons have been both timely and timeless, that they will hold up over time. And bringing them has been a blessing to me and to a number of people who have so testified. But as those lessons came to an end and today's lesson was approaching, I've been struggling with whether to separate those lessons off as a series unto themselves and call this lesson, today's lesson, number two in the Christian Experience series, or if I should try to work my way back from where we left off last week and try to integrate these lessons more fully into this series, which I would have done by teaching a lesson that I had planned to call, Let's Ask Jesus. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God allow innocent people to suffer and die? Why does God not prevent the innocent from injustice or from tyranny or from violence, insult, and injury? I don't know. Let's ask Jesus. And that would have been all right. But God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. And last Sunday morning, I got an email from Jama Grave that I meant to read to you earlier, and I don't have it here with me, but she was asking about whether the word nakam in the Old Testament means repent or comfort, and asking what bearing that should have on our understanding of the word metaneo, which is Greek for repent. Now, I wrote back to her right away and told her that I would give her an answer before the end of the week. And I did write back to her, but not until late Thursday night, because in the meantime, I was letting things simmer. Now, I've had lots of people tell me that they don't understand how my mind works. <laughs> well, welcome to the club. I don't really understand that either. 
I just know that whenever I get an idea with a great deal of potential, the best thing for me to do is busy myself with other things. Because if I keep that idea on the back burner for a few days, stir it occasionally, and keep dropping other ideas into the mix, eventually it will distill. The dross will burn off, and what remains will eventually coalesce into a discernible form. The key scripture for last week's lesson was Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And my message last week, in a nutshell, was that the best response the church can make to the ills that plague our nation is for us to get our house in order, for us to clean our house. Because if we who are called by the Lord's name shall humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, he will hear from heaven, he will forgive our sins, and he will heal our land. And I had this on my mind when I read a post on Facebook posted by another church here in town, Steamboat. See, if you don't know, a week or two ago, the General Conference voted to uphold its previous position on in general, and clergy in particular, which position is a biblical position. But the pastor of the church does not believe that is a sin which requires repentance. And last week he wrote an op-ed in the Steamboat Pilot in which he stated that it is his intention to defy the general conference on this matter. And this week he posted a picture of a church sign bearing the legend, God loves you just the way you are. Well, everybody knows that, but here at what we might start calling the brain of Steamboat, uh, <laughs> we would add, but he doesn't want you to stay that way. Because the message that God loves us for who we are is a false message. God loves us in spite of who we are, and he loves us for who we can become. Well, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole. But when I started putting my thoughts about that post together with my conclusion from last week's sermon, Jama's question about the word Nacham, and my understanding that the passion of Christ is as much about change as it is about suffering, it all began to coalesce into a cohesive plan for where I want to take this sermon series next. You see, to translate from one language to another is more than simply to substitute words from the source language to the target language. Because words have meaning, but they have more than meaning. That is, they have more than semantic meaning. Words have experiential meaning. And this is nowhere more evident than with the word Naham. Several years ago, I saw a very interesting episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. And in this particular episode, the crew of the Enterprise ran across a race of people called the Tamarians. Now, the Tamarians weren't completely foreign when the Enterprise encountered them. According to this episode, the Federation had run into them before, but had been unable to communicate with them because they found their language unintelligible, and all attempts to decipher their language had failed. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details of the story, but you know how television works. You know how the rhythm of a one-hour episode of any action drama or mystery series TV show goes. In the first three minutes, a problem or a challenge or a mystery is introduced. Eight minutes into the episode, a theory about how to solve the mystery is proffered, but that theory always turns out to be wrong. Twenty-eight minutes into the episode, a second theory to solve the mystery is suggested, but that theory always turns out to be wrong, too. Then, in the 48th minute, we get the denouement. A light comes on, and all the information comes together, and somebody says, Eureka! I have found it! The third theory. <laughs> And that theory almost always turned out to be the right answer. Well, this TV program followed that pattern to a T. And about 48 minutes in, the card began to figure out how the Temerian language worked. And it turns out that in order to understand their language, you had to know their history. 
and not just their history in general, but specific events in their history and what those events meant to them. Because the Tamarians spoke only in metaphors, and these metaphors all referred to historical events. For instance, Dathan, the captain of the Tamarian ship, kept reaching out to Picard and saying, Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. But Picard didn't know what that meant. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. It didn't make any sense. Until the crew figured out that Darmok and Jalad were historical figures and that Tanagra was an historical place. Darmok and Jalad were military men generals of opposing armies who, owing to unforeseen circumstances, found themselves on an island, the island of Tanagra, facing a common enemy. And this enemy was stronger than either of them individually, but not stronger than the two of them put together. So these two generals made peace with one another and joined forces together to defeat their common enemy. And that was the beginning of a long-standing alliance, a long-standing friendship. And when Picard figured that out, he understood that what Dathan was trying to say to him when he would reach out and say Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra was, let's be friends, let's work together, let's be allies. Now, there were other metaphors from the Temerian language that I found interesting. For instance, Temba, his arms open wide, means I have a gift for you. Shaka, when the walls fell, means someone has died in battle. And mirab, with sails unfurled, means full speed ahead. Now, I know that I'm a dork. I get that. I don't have it on today, but I got a new watch for Valentine's Day from Emily. And on the back, it's inscribed, dork of my heart. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm a nerd. You don't have to point that out to me. But this really captured my imagination. Because even though this was a fictional story about a fictional people speaking a fictional language, when I heard these expressions, I found it easy to imagine their origins and how they might have come to mean what they meant to the people of Tamaria. And because of that, it was easy for me to come up with examples of common experiences in our culture that could be related in much the same way. For instance, all of you would know exactly what I meant if I said, the eagle on the sea of tranquility or Walter reaching for his glasses, his grief unveiled, or Sully on the Hudson, his wings outspread. So one of my first thoughts when I saw this episode was, clearly whoever wrote the script for that storyline understands language and how it works. And not just how it works semantically, but also, more importantly, how it works viscerally. How it is that we communicate with others through language beyond the tongue and the ear. On a rudimentary level, on a guttural level, on a heart-to-heart -heart level. And there's no language in which that reality is more palpably true than in biblical Hebrew. Because Hebrew is fundamentally a language of intuitive evocation. It's very different for instance, from modern English. And not just because it's much older and has a completely different alphabet and is written from right to left and so on, but because of the way that it arises from the human soul. Because English seems to be chiefly designed to express one's thoughts. And as such, it seems to descend to the tongue from the brain. But Hebrew seems to be chiefly designed to express one's experiences. And as such, it seems to arise to the tongue from the heart. And because of that, translating from Hebrew into English can present us with some real challenges at times. Because when it comes to any given word, the English translator is constantly asking of the Hebrew, what does this mean? And the Hebrew answers gently but persistently, you're asking the wrong question. I can tell you what this means, but I'd much rather demonstrate to you what it expresses. And nowhere is that more evident than with the Hebrew word, nakam. Because in order for us to really apprehend what's being communicated with this word, we need to pay attention, not just to what it means, but also, and just as importantly, to what it expresses. But what this word expresses is very difficult to put into words in English. In Romans 8.26, Paul says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And that's what the word nakam at its root expresses. Groanings, too deep for words. Perhaps you remember from grammar school being introduced to the usage of onomatopoeia, which is the usage of words that evoke the sound to which they refer, such as the word meow for the sound that a cat makes, or the word fizzle for the sound that carbonated beverages make as they effervesce. Well, 
The word Naham is onomatopoeic for a variety of sounds that people make whenever we breathe in an expressive way. And it's intended to evoke the experiences that go with those breaths. In a way, it corresponds with the English word sigh, which used to sound much more like the breath that it expresses centuries ago when the GH at the end of sigh was not silent and the word was pronounced sigh. Now, the first time that we encounter the word Nacham in the Bible is in Genesis 5, 28 through 29, where we are introduced to Noah. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son, and he named him Noah, saying, Out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this is the one who shall bring us Nacham from our work and from the toil of our hands. And from the context, it's easy to supply the sound that the word Nacham is intended to evoke here. This is the one who will bring us from our work and from the toil of our hands. So Noah, whose name is derived from the word Nacham, at least by way of a pun, is the person that Lamech hopes will breathe new life into his people. So he gives him the name Nuach, Noah, which not only means to draw breath, but which rhymes with Ruach, the Hebrew word for the Spirit of God, which in Genesis sweeps across the face of the deep, breathing his breath into the creation. Which breath sustains all things? As Job tells us in Job 34, 15 through 15, if God ever resolved to withdraw his spirit from the universe, beckoning the breath of life to return to him, then every living thing would die in an instant and humankind would return to dust. But... The imagery doesn't stop there. Because while Noah, whose name again means to draw breath, along with his family, was on the ark breathing freely, when we learn in Genesis 7.22 that every creature on dry land that has the breath of life in its nostrils died. And how did they die? By drowning, by suffocation, by having their breath taken away. Which breath is referred to here using a word that's very closely related to Nacham, the same word used in Genesis 2 to refer to God breathing the breath of life into humankind when he first created them. Now, I could give more examples, but no more needed. You get the idea. The word Nacham appears in the Old Testament 108 times in 100 verses. And every time it appears, a negotiation must occur between the text and the reader. And what's being negotiated is fundamentally how we ought to receive that which is communicated by a sigh. Now, that isn't impossible, but it does require nimble and intuitive linguistic thinking. And nowhere is this more evident than in Genesis 6, 6 through 7, where in the King James Version it reads, And it repented, Nacham, the Lord, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me, Nacham, that I have made them. Now, this translation makes perfect sense within the context of Genesis 6, but it does present us with certain problems. After all, in Numbers 23, 19, it says, God is neither a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. And again, in 1 Samuel 15, 29, the strength of Israel will neither lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. So it seems that there ought to be a way to translate Genesis 6, 6 through 7, that doesn't have God doing something that the Bible tells us he will not do. Well, I have been living in Genesis 6 for the last week now, immersing myself in every possible permutation of this passage. I think I found something that not only resolves this apparent contradiction in Scripture, but also ties together all the elements that I've woven into today's sermon and to this sermon series so far. And what is it that I have found? What is the answer to this question? What is the panacea that addresses all the questions that I've raised in today's lesson? Come back next week, and I'll tell you. That's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well-appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30, 
and worship services are at 1030. We look forward to meeting you. Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.